Hello. So my name is Clément Escoffier. Here is Paulo Lopez. We are Vertex core developer, and we are going to present you Vertex. Everything you need to know about Vertex today, about Vertex 3.1. So 3.1 is the last release we did. And the first thing you can see is that, well, this is, no this is not PowerPoint. This is not Keynote. What we will do first is to say, well, what about using Vertex to serve your slides? So one thing I did, so I just used uh, Reveal.js to do my slides. So it's a simple HTML page uh, with plenty of image, you will see. But I move that inside a file jar. So a jar file that contains absolutely everything, all the dependencies. And I will just start it. To start a Vertex application that is packaged as a file jar, it's a Java dash jar. I just use uh, this transport just to not collide with a different demo we are going to do. So I just start this and done. Normally, uh, hopefully, I should get my slide here. Yes, here they are. So I will just. Okay, so here are our slides. So these slides are actually served by a Vertex instance. So the title is Be Reactive on the GVM, but not only in Java. Two things are important here. Be reactive, what does that mean? And not only in Java. So we are going to explain that. We are going to explain much more how the new Vertex is more in the DevOps way, how you can build microservice applications, why you can build games or stuff like that. So what is Vertex? First, Vertex is not a container, it's not an app server, it's a framework. It doesn't come with anything, any type of, it's, you do whatever you want. It's unopinated. So unopinated, what it means, it means that we provide you everything to do whatever you want, but we don't force you to do anything. You don't want Fajr, don't do Fajr. You want Docker container, do Docker container. You don't want to experiment this like that. You want to put your sources in the lib folder. You can. There is nothing you can't do. It's completely unopinionated. So sometimes it's really cool because you can really adapt Vertex to your own needs. Sometimes you might be a bit lost because well, how you organize your source, how you organize your test, and so on. So it's about that. Well, everything about that will be explained here. Um, it's reactive. So that means that it's this new trend of Cine where things are reactive and so on. I'm going to explain that in the next slide, as well as the polyglot aspect. And the last point is it's distributed. Wow, today, 2015, finally, it's distributed. So what does that mean? It means that all our Vertex application can interact with each other, can discover each other, can send events, can get reply, and so on. You don't have to do anything. So. Reactive. A couple of years ago, one or two years ago, a couple of guys met and decided to write a manifesto about what reactive means. Actually, there is no really consensus about what reactive means today, but if we read the manifesto, there is two big pillars there. One, it needs to be responsiveness. What does that mean? That means that your system must always reply to your user, to your request, in an acceptable time. I'll let you define what acceptable means, so if a couple of seconds is acceptable or just a couple of milliseconds. So it needs to be responsive on various workloads. So it can be one user at a time or one million users at a time. It needs to still be responsive. And the second thing is it, it still needs to be responsive even if there is an earthquake and everything crash, it still needs to be there and, re and reply to the request. So this is pretty big properties. And to do that, they said in this manifesto that the message driven, asynchronous message passing is the best way to achieve it. So Vertex implements such patterns. The second thing is that it's polyglot. Vertex needs a JVM, Java 8, OpenGDK, or Oracle, or whatever other uh, Java 8. You can even use JamVM for people that uh, want a really lightweight JVM. Uh, you can develop your applications in Java, Groovy, Ruby, JavaScript, Soonish Ceylon before the end of the year. We also support by the community Scala, Python, Kotlin, and um, uh, TypeScript. But you can also mix all those languages together inside the very same applications. So if one part of your application says, well, Groovy will be much better because I want to do file things and so on, or it's more like a script, you can do it. If you prefer using JavaScript to implement a server, 
side JavaScript, you can do it. You uh, can use any of this language, and you can mix each other. So I let Paolo. Well, the whole concept of uh, Vertex is that we live on the React pattern. So basically, we have one single event loop. So we see an event loop as a single thread. And because uh, we have a single thread, it means that we can never be blocked. If we are blocked, then uh, all the applications stop. So in order to overcome this uh, situation, we have handlers. So a handler basic, basically is um, <coughs> Handler is, is, is a way that we, we have to work around the, the, the blocking model. So in a typical program, you would have uh, the return of your function be return on the return statement. In our case, we have to create these uh, kind of objects. We call them handlers. And where we would put a return value, we now do handler the result. So. One thing about the event loop is that you must never block it. Because what happens is that it will get the first event and then find the handler that receive it, dispatch it. Next event, dispatch it. As we have only a few threads, well, one event loop, if one of the handlers blocks, then all the, other, all the events cannot be delivered anymore. So you must never, ever block the golden or the, the event loop. It is the vertex golden rules. So, but sometimes you have really, really, really a lot of events. So what happens when you have this? Well, when we have uh, lots of events, uh, uh, for people that are familiar with other frameworks like Node.js, what you usually do is that you need to fork your process and try to use all the cores. So because Node.js, one core means one event loop. In Vertex, this is all managed for you. When we start, we... Uh, check how many co CPU cores does your uh, machine have. And from that moment, we spawn as many event loops as CPU cores. So this, this means that, uh, for example, this, uh, this laptop, for example, has eight cores. If I would run a normal Node.js application here, I would only be using one eighth of its uh, CPU potential. And if I start here the same application using Vertex, I will be I'll be able to use 100% of its CPU power. So it's a pretty big difference, and we call this pattern the multi-reactor pattern. Um, well, I spoke since the beginning about events, but what, can, what are events in Vertex? Actually, it's just an object. So it can be a message, it can be a string, it can be a notification, it can be an HTTP request, it can be a TCP request, it can be a command, so for example, if you interact with Redis, a file, a result, and it can be anything. So this is really important to say, even if it's called event, it can be any of your objects. So something that is really important here is this asynchronous development model. As Paulo said, we don't have return. We don't use return because Return means that the caller is blocked until the return uh, is uh, emitted. So what we do here, we have this operation with two parameters, and we pass a handlers. Handlers in Java 8 is just a lambda expression or a reference on a method. It's up to you. So my method can compute the result, and when it's done, it just calls my handler. Well, actually, it can still do stuff after calling my handler. For example, logging that, OK, it's completed, and so on. While with a return, you can't do anything after the return. So it's one of the powers that this model gave. So as, as Clement just uh, explained, handler is a functional interface. So what you need to do is to implement the handle method. And uh, because we use uh, also generics, you can use the, you specify the type you expect there. And because we are in Java 8, you don't need to make anonymous classes anymore. You can just use a uh, lambda expression, as we do here, right here. For example, if you uh, look at the in initial example, we could say like this operation takes argument one and two, and we use the compressed uh, lambda expression where t will be the result. So it means when that piece of code was there that you see handle dot handle t is called, what it happens is that in the end the T will be, uh, be executing system on print line T. So let's have a look at a much bigger example. This is typically the code that you will write in Vertex to start an HTTP server. 
Again, Vertex is not a container, Vertex is not an app server, so if you want to serve a HTTP request, you just do create a HTTP server. So we have two handlers here. The first handler is a request handler. It will be invoked every time an HTTP request arrives. So that means that the HTTP request will be um, dispatched by the event loop, and when it will be its time, um, the, this handler will be called with this uh, HTTP request. So here, what I do with the HTTP request is just get the response and say hello there. So here, my type of message is an HTTP request. The second handler is a bit more interesting. So when you start an HTTP server, it takes time. So here, we pass a handler to say, well, let me know when you're done. But the thing is, when you start an HTTP server, there is many, many reasons why it could fail. Well, for example, and what happens often for me is that I already have a uh, HTTP on a server on the same port. So here it will be 8080. So this handler gets an async result. So it's a structure which is provided by Vertex, which gives you an idea about what happened in the operation. So async result will tell you if it has failed, and if it's successful, can give you access to the, um, uh, to the result. Yeah, something that is pretty different. We don't have return, but we don't have really try catch or an exception. Because the exception will be in the event loop, and you should never block the event loop, and you should definitely not kill the event loop. So we don't throw exception. We create features that failed. So async results that say, well, I'm f I've failed. Here is my cause. So the cause is a throwable object. Do whatever you want with it. I'm done. So it's how it works. So yeah, it looks really different from what you do in Java and other language, but actually it makes the code very, very readable with Java 8 and method reference and stuff like that. So something that is really important is that for lots of people, asynchronous means threads. How many threads do I need to run this? So it's a really, really complicated code that just do an add between two numbers. So add. The first integer, the second integer, and when the computation is done, I call this handler. So that would be my uh, synchronous method. And then I do something with it. I just call one, one, and get the result. So this part here will be called by the caller thread. So it will be my thread. Obviously, this will be called in the same thread. And this will be called exactly in the same thread. So you can be asynchronous with only one thread. So don't think that we have lots of threads on your cross thread to be asynchronous. That's not true. Look at this. So, oops. Wrong button. Yeah, that was ESC. <laughs> <laughs> so it was really reveal JS, you see. Um, <coughs> so in the event, uh, the in, in Vertex, uh, we've been talking about these uh, messages. We need to pass messages, receive messages, and we have uh, we have we have a mechanism where we uh, uh, that that allows us to distribute these messages messages. So think of it like the the postman. The postman is our event bus. So in the, you if every time you want to send a message, you create an object, you put it on uh, event bus, and event bus will look at this opaque string which is an address like your home address, and it will look. W which part of the code is listening for this address and will deliver that message at that address. We have several kinds of uh, uh, modes. We have uh, the, the typical point-to-point -point messages when I, when, I, when I say I want to send this message from A to B. Uh, we have the mode of uh, pub, pub sub, publish uh, subscribe, when I say uh, I'm going to have several pieces of code listening on the same address. This will be really messed up for our mailman. And then we say, okay, send it to everyone. And we have the last uh, mode, which is the request response, which is kind of a RPC model, where you can say, send a message from A to B, and B says, okay, I'm done, send a reply back to A. So we, ha we have all these three models. So you send events through this event bus, but the code that will receive these events are handlers, obviously. So it will depend on the type of message, but actually it's there. And locally, that's pretty important, it will be delivered by the event loop. Why locally it's important? It's every part of your Vertex app can access the event bus. And it's important because the event bus is distributed. 
So you don't have to do anything to send an event to another GVM or another part of your application as soon as you know the address. So it can be topic or whatever. So Vertex will create a cluster automatically. And will, so all this, all this three uh, part of your application will be connected and can interact using events. And locally, you have the event loops that will dispatch the events. So this is really interesting uh, how it works, but in 3.1, we went really further by providing the concept of bridge, where not only Vertex, app can interact with the event loop, but also other things, like a node application, like a binary application, like uh, anything. So we provide um, bridges for, so here it would be a SOCGS bridge, TCP bridge, Stone bridge, IMQP bridge, and so on. And what happens is it's a bidirectional bridge. When an event arrives, we map it to the event bus, and when uh, something on the event bus needs to be delegated to, some, to the uh, outside world, it will be transformed and sent. So we can really bridge uh, our, event bridge, uh, our event bus with almost anything. So that means that in addition to be a reactive polyglot, you can use it as an integration framework for almost anything. So let's do a demo of this. And here I have a small program. So as you can see, there is no real development model. So you, you can use it directly like that. So it's a main method, something we was doing at the well, at school, so we don't need anything. That will be your entry point. We create a Vertex instance, which is clustered here. And as cluster takes time, it's asynchronous. And I get this uh, handler here that will say, hey, I'm done. So when I'm done, what this piece of code is doing is that every second, it will send an event on this is my address, events. And this is my message. Here, I use JSON object, but it can be anything. So I just say hello from a Java producer. So let's start this. And let's see if the network is working. It's going to be interesting. So I'll start this. OK. So here in this demo, I will use the Hazelcast cluster manager. But the cluster management system from Vertex is pluggable. So right now, we support Hazelcast, Ggroups, and the Keeper, where Hazelcast is the default. Uh, but you can also implement your own if you have something different as a discovery protocol and so on. And we are looking, uh, we are going to implement better, well, different cluster manager in the next release, such as DNS base and so on. So here is my uh, uh, provider. It has started. So let's start the consumer here. So consumer is also a main method. Um, it gets the event bus and say, well, every time there is an event on this, just call this handler. So it will just display it. Very simple. That. So what you will see here, and we'll see if it's working or not. Yes, it works. So it has really discovered it, and we have a cluster of two nodes. So yeah, OK, it's only two nodes, but yeah. And you will see that every second, I uh, display the message. This application go a bit further because here you see, hey, configure the SOCGS bridge. So SOCGS is a JavaScript library that start with web, well, that lets your browser and uh, your server communicate using a bidirectional way like WebSockets. It's a bit smarter because it will start with WebSockets and degrade smoothly to to uh, everything to to uh, long TCP pooling. pooling. Yeah, yeah TCP example. pooling as well. So. Now, if I go there, and uh, oh, that's the next demo. OK, yeah. So here, you see, so I'm really bad at uh, web UI, as you can see. Okay, um, plus plus. Zoom. Oh, yeah, I need to zoom. So it just written, hello, Java producer. And as I'm getting old, it's written it. Everything's gone another time, so I can remember. Uh, OK, well, let's see if I can get Node sending events to this page. So what I will do here. Up, I go there. I have a very, very simple node application. Um, I'll show you. It's very simple. So it requires this library here that we provide. So it's SOCGS based in this case, but uh, we provide this. And you create the event bus. And it's on NPM JS, so you don't need to do any magical stuff to get it from Maven, for example. Yeah, it's uh, also packaged as a web jar on Bower, on almost all repository you will find it. Um, and what it does, it opens the event bus and 
every second, it just said bonjour, I'm French, um, uh, from the node producer. So let's start this. Started. So I'll see on our page, hey, we now have hello from Java producer and bonjour from node producer. So here, what happens is that I have clients. I have a producer in Java. I have a producer in Node, and they are all interconnected and sending events. I didn't almost did anything. It's really 10 lines of code every time. So it's already, whoa, what we can do is this. So obviously here, we are just sending very simple message, but you can imagine anything. So let's stop this application here and go back here. Ooh. So we've been talking about these um, pieces of codes, and uh, uh, we and, and we showed some some code where we're just using a plain plain a POJO and a, a main a main method. However, we have some helper classes that will uh, help you organize your code and your application. We call them verticals. Verticals are like this uh, this small unit uh, where you can easily start your application. And the only thing you need to do is implement two, two methods. You need to implement the start method and the stop method. So on the start, you will be already the vertex object instance will be already set up for you. So you can start right away writing your code. And uh, once you have these, uh, these verticals, it also helps you to with the deployment because you don't need to, as I said, there's no need for the bootstrap, so you can just use the vertex object itself and say deploy this. Uh, class name, and say that you want to scale, say that you want to have several instances of the same vertical. You can, instead of having to do that to work manually, you can just say deploy this vertical using these options, set number of instances to three. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, distantiates us from other projects is, is that we also have the high availability uh, support. So, say that we deploy a uh, vertical in uh, one JVM and our cluster is composed by, in this example, two JVMs. Say if the vertical crashes on uh, JVM1 and it was deployed with high availability uh, set to true, it, this means that vertex will monitor it and notice that the vertical died and will spawn it on uh, same JVM, so it will use the other JVM and it will be automatically deployed there, so your service recovers and you can continue. So let's demonstrate these two features, so several instances and actual availability and high availability. So the first example, I should stop. Yeah, I stopped it. it, will be kind of weird, but the idea here, let's have a vertical. So in Java, to have a vertical, you just do extend abstract vertical. That's all. So in this example, I still have a main method uh, where I just say, hey, deploy me twice. But the start method is starting an HTTP server. So what will happen? Well, binding exception. Because the two instances are going to try to bind to the ATAT ports, and obviously, it cannot work. So here there is a bit of magic. What Vertex is doing here is that it will implement the round robin for you. So it's a non-strict round robin, but it will take the first request, first vertical, second request, second vertical. Each instance will be, um, will be uh, attached to different event loop. So that means that you can ha go up to your um, number of core for the same vertical. So for example, here, eight, eight instances, and the load balancing is made by Vertex. You don't need to do anything. This round robin works for all TCP-based connections, so TCP, HTTP, and so on. So let's start this. Yep, should be here. So if I go back uh, here and do curl, because curl is my best browser. So uh, event loop three, event loop two, event loop three, event loop two, event loop three. What happens if I do that in my browser? And two, zoom, two, oh, pardon, sorry. Two, 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 two. Oh, is it not working? It's not working. Should do the load balancing. Actually, it's, the connection is still alive. 
modern browser keep the connection alive. So as soon as your browser starts using an event loop, it will keep it. It's like sticky station, actually. But you don't have to do anything. <coughs> so that was for the more than two in, uh, for the uh, instance. So you can easily uh, scale your application like that. Uh, you don't have to do anything. You just say, OK, how many instances you want? Um, the second thing is the hard availability. So for this one, I will start what we call a bare instance. A bare instance is a vertex instance that will be on the cluster and that does, does not have any vertical deployed. It's not required. It will, uh, uh, higher availability works also with a uh, uh, vertex instance with a vertical deploy, just for this example. So I will start this uh, instance here. Oops, yeah. So we'll use the Hazelcast cluster manager here. And yeah, it should be. Yes. yes. Okay. And I have another vertical again. So I'm extend abstract vertical. I start a cluster vertex, so it will be on the same uh, cluster. And I have enable uh, actually to true, to true. And this one is starting an HTTP server again. So if I start this, it's uh, will join the cluster. Yes. And if I go there. OK, so what you see here, I don't know if it's Mac, uh, Mac OS X specific or not, but it's the idea of my GVM. And this is my, uh, process, uh, my process ID, my PID. So right now, this page is served by the uh, PID uh, 17, 9, uh, 30, 13. So let's kill this one. So I can show you that it's probably here. Yes, it's that one. So failover works when there is really when the GVM crash, check fault, and so on. So it's not Control C won't uh, doesn't is not enough. It must really crash. So a kill minus line crashes. If I do that, so the process here has been killed. You see it, and if I go back here, it has been migrated. So what happens? My first instances, my bare instances, doesn't have any vertical deployed. So what happens is while well, this node has left, has crashed. I take what was deployed here, I move it somewhere else, so to the same node, and we start it from here. So we don't migrate state, we just migrate what was deployed and all the verticals that were deployed. But this is higher availability for free. So if you have multiple instances and high availability all together, you have a large, really large spectrum of possibility where your application can scale up, scale down, uh, auto repair, uh, and so on. And you don't have to tweak anything to be a, uh, no, this is given. I will just stop this application because I'm sure I will forget later. So as we said in the beginning, uh, Vertex is also polyglot. And until now, we've just been uh, showing you Java, as you can see on the top right uh, corner. Uh, we also support, as we said in the beginning, uh, Ruby, uh, JavaScript, and, and Groovy uh, as part of our core uh, polyglot support. But we don't, do, uh, we don't use just uh, uh, the, this JRuby or Groovy uh, bindings. We, really generate some APIs that are more look-alike and more look more traditional and familiar for people using these languages. For example, if you look at the Ruby example in the bottom left, uh, you see that uh, we don't use camel case to define the event bus, but use the, the snake case. If you look at the JavaScript example on the top right, uh, uh, the same. We use a camel case to get the uh, thing. And all the APIs uh, look look the same. One important thing is that all this uh, polyglot, polyglot feature is generated from our Java interfaces. This means that they are not uh, end, end written on every release we do. So this also means that if you guys decide to say, OK, I'm going to use uh, JavaScript or Groovy for my, for my vertical, and uh, there's a new uh, minor release of Vertex or a new major release of Vertex, you don't need to be afraid that, oh, uh, I don't know if the new API will also work with uh, Groovy or JavaScript, because this is all generated at the runtime for, uh, for, for you guys. 
So everything we said so far can be summarized in one slide. If you remember that, so this slide, you are a Vertex expert. So we will do the reverse story. Everything I will just say, but in the reverse, uh, in the opposite way, let's try to do that. So first, Vertex lets you implement polyglot applications. So that means applications that can be developed in JavaScript, Ruby, Groovy, or Java, or all together. It's up to you. These applications can be packaged or not, or organized or not, as verticals. It's not mandatory. It's up to you to do it. This application will communicate using events. These events will be dispatched around an event bus that is distributed. Locally, on each uh, uh, instances, we have event loops. As many event loops as CPU core you have, and uh, locally, the events will be dispatched using these event loops inside handlers. That's all. If you remember this, you are a Vertex expert and you can get your Vertex diploma, well, your Vertex stickers. We don't have diploma yet. So, funny thing is that so far we didn't really show anything, right? It was not that, well, I display a couple of things, hello, 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 but what can we really do with Vertex? Well, we have lots of uh, components already implemented uh, for you guys. We have, we have a web framework, we have SMTP support for mail, we have security with some auth uh, uh, component, we can connect to databases, you, uh, we have plain old JDBC, we have a, a synchronous Redis, a synchronous Mongo. You can even use a shell command to control and uh, check the state of your verticals. We c you can deploy it on Docker, you can deploy it on OpenShift, you can collect metrics. Uh, we have bindings with Ocular, Ocular. and uh, Drop Wizard. Drop We're Wizard. Hot U2, so Jolokia. Jolokia. Uh, for you guys that are interested in Reactive, we have some initial support for Rx. Uh, for people coming from Java, uh, we have JCA support. And then we have all the bridges the, to connect, say, to Storm, to SOC.js. Uh, TCP is not uh, here listed. And what are the bridges? Well, there is a service proxies too. So I don't know if you know, but there is this small hype right now about microservices. I don't know if you heard about that. Um, probably now, yeah, no. it's a small hype. And we also have things for you to build a microservice application with Vertex. So, so um, as as been talking uh, all, all the time, we are synchronous, synchronous. Uh, so if we have to to think of uh, JDBC, JDBC by nature is not asynchronous. So what we have, we we have this uh, small component we call a client, a JDBC client, which will uh, transform asynchronous calls into to JDBC. So the way it works is that you you create a, qu a query or a command and you pass this. To, to the client, and you all, of course you need to also pass a handler to, to get the result. So the client will then go do its work. It will connect the database, get the data, and uh, once it's done, we'll wrap the data in some format that you understand, and then invoke your handler and give you back the the, the result. So to to think in terms of code, this is more or less how it looks like. So we have the JDBC client. You ask for a connection. And then you pass an handler, so this is the first lambda. So once uh, the JDBC client has the connection, it calls you with the handler. You get the connection from AR dot result. So AR is stands for a synchronous result, but it's the name of the variable. You could call it whatever you want. So you have this uh, uh, JDBC SQL connection, and then you ask for for data. So you make a query, select star from beer. And of course, this would normally would block your, your code, so you don't want to block. So again, you pass it to the handler, and you call it a response. And then if the response didn't fail, well, yeah, you get the list of, of, the, the, of the rows, and you can iterate them, print them, do whatever you want, and continue with your code. And you can drink the beer. You can also drink the beer, yes. So the second major component we have that is really, really used is Vertex Web. Vertex Web is a way, it's a framework that lets you implement sophisticated, modern web applications in an asynchronous fashion. So it works almost the same. So normally, it's generally, it's blocking, and you have threads that uh, uh, um, each connection is under by a thread, and so on. Here, it's not, it doesn't work like that. We have an HTTP server, <coughs> vertex.create HTTP server. This HTTP server, we associate a router, which is an object that comes with Vertex Web. And this router, we declare a set of routes. 
while when you get a get request on this path, call this handler. When we get a post request on this, do that. Handlers can be chained and so on. So when you get an HTTP request, the router is called and say, OK, so who is going to handle this? He will find the root, call the handler, and the handler will write the, the response. Handler can also be chained and so on. So let's look at some code. So first thing, you create a router. So router.router, .router, and you pass a vertex instance. Then the first route I will declare is, OK, let's save a couple of uh, static files from a file system or from my fat jar or whatever. Like these slides are saved, are saved like that. So I create a static handler and uh, asset is the name of my directory. You can also implement REST API with this. You just do router.get the path, and then you attach the handlers that you want to call. With Java 8, you can use method reference like that. So you don't need to have callback and to callback and callback and callback. No, you can really use references and keep your code really readable and clean. So then we have a special handler for uh, to pass your body. We just by default it's not done because it takes time. So if you expect a body, you need to register it. You can register your root with star. So that means. You, you can uh, embed several routes, and um, then post, pod, delete so all the uh, REST verbs, and so, HTTP verbs, and so on. While we have pass variables, you can, we have cookies and stuff like that. Everything is made in an asynchronous way. So a uh, Vertex app developed like that is really, really fast and really scalable. So at the end, when you have all your routes, you create your HTTP server, and a request on there say, well, the router is going to do that for me. So you just say router accept, and you listen on the part you want. That's all. So microservices with Vertex. So yeah, except if you was living in a cave or missed all the talk from the last uh, three days, you probably uh, saw a talk mentioning at least microservices. So first, microservices are not about REST. Microservices are not about HTTP. Microservices are not about Kubernetes or Docker. It's much broader than this. It's an architectural style. It's kind of close to SOA, but we are not allowed to say it because, well, all you guys hate, hate SOA, right? That was a big, big thing and so on. So we are not allowed to say it, so I didn't say it. So can we build microservice application with Vertex? Well, when Vertex was started, it pushed this model without, being, without calling it microservices. Actually, uh, the first microservice application I found is uh, the IBM 1901 uh, uh, from October 1959. It's a computer that has a Fortran compiler, which is based on microservices. While the IBM didn't call that microservices, actually, it's, I fear that IBM did the first microservice application, and they didn't call that SOA, so they called yeah. yeah. phases. Yeah, phases. Yeah, they call that phases. So, so it's pretty old. It's just a new hype. And in Vertex, we were more or less doing this uh, before the hype. So what we do is we generally package our application as a fat jar. So when you go and see your uh, uh, production guy, you did a fat jar. So you can do it with uh, uh, Gradle, Maven, uh, Eclipse export, whatever, and. anything. Ant, <laughs> uh, make, imagine, you can even use make. Um, and you build the fat jar. You give that to your production team, and you just say, well, just do a Java jar. That's all. That's all you need. So all your parts of your application are going to interact using the events. So they're kind of cool. It's already sending events and so on. So we go a bit further is that we have those bridges. So you can interact with microservices that interact using different protocols, such as Stomp, IMQP, TCP, and so on. And it's not only. Vertex microservices. You can interact with Node, as I, sh I showed in the demo, or whatever, or C, or C code or Fortran code. Yeah. Yeah. If I you know. have a Fortran application, um, we also provide so HTTP. Also, so, so we can expose REST API, of course, but we can also um, uh, we also have an asynchronous HTTP client to consume HTTP. So you don't need to have uh, your own HTTP client to provide one. It's part of Vertex. So you can really build a um, really polyglot system like that, because every, all this part can be developed in different languages, but using different stack. 
Some part can use Mongo, some cat can use Drop Wizard, some cat can use well, Spring. Be crazy. Some cat can be even implemented using Wildfly or Java E. Wow. And all together can interact. We have bridge for all those technologies, so it's really let you uh, do whatever you want. Something to not forget is that for every piece that are vertex, you have the scalability with the instances and the failover for free. So we go a bit further, because well, if your services uh, need to send events, get reply, well, it's kind of cumbersome, and at some point, at the end of the day, you are, you're a bit tired. So what we do is generate everything for you. So you have a Java interface. This Java interface contains asynchronous methods, so with handlers and no return. And with two annotations, Vertex will automatically generate the code publishing this and wrapping event from the event bus to this and the clients. So the, the client is generated for all languages support, so you can consume a service in any language. We go even further. We also generate JavaScript clients that you can consume, use from browser or node. That means you do a Vertex service somewhere on the cloud. You don't care. It will be on the event bus. You have your browser application here. Your browser application can just use this service. It doesn't need anything. That's really what we can do. That's one of the most advanced features we saw around microservices today. So let's have a look at this. Um, so yeah, everything is stopped. So I have um, an application which is composed by um, several vertical, but right, for this application, I deploy it in the same GVM. Yeah, because we say, well, vertical and so on, but actually, you can have more than one vertical in, in your application, in your, the same GVM. It's really up to you. There is no rules. You, you, it's really up to you, up to your uh, granularity of your vertical and so on. So I just create uh, this, so I have this main vertical that deploy two sub-vertical. Let's try that. I will package it as a fat jar. So, where it is. So here, I will use Maven to build my fat jar. You can use whatever you want. And the thing is, Vertex is providing a launcher class that implements a main method, so you don't have to do anything. You just say, hey, that's the vertical I want to deploy. And at the end. So here is my fat jar. Yes. Up. And I want to launch it like in production, so as a background service. So normally you need an init D and so on and so on, but here you just say start. And it's there. Just start the application in the background. You don't have to provide anything to do anything. So let's have a look to the application. And no, I'm definitely considered an, an alcoholic. So uh, I'm a whiskey drinker. And as it's the end of the year, I'm running out of whiskey. Hopefully, Christmas is not that far, so I will get new bottle for Christmas. If one of you want to offer me a gift, there it is. Um, well, it's a very simple Vertex web application. It's the REST API. Uh, everything is described on our blog on how to build that. Well, I can show you, for example, I can add a new, new whiskey. So it's a whiskey, actually, in this case. And so it's as written in the GDBC database and so on. So that's just the application. We can have a look at this code. So we have a GDBC client that I create here. Um, and then I start the application, chaining the different ob ob uh, things. And I should have, yes, here I have my Vertex Web uh, root, so the assets, and my REST API, and so on. And then I start it on the uh, port 8080, and so on. So actually, it's quite simple, and it's not much more complicated than anything else, even if it's asynchronous. Uh, if I can have a look at, for example, get one. Get one is just get one whiskey. You get the routing context. You get the parameters, which is the ID name. You look up. You get a GDBC connection. You do your request. You get it. You send it back. So it's quite simple for all of them, and all of them are implemented like that. So. Yeah, OK, but I've started my application in background. It's somewhere. And I really would like to 
interact with it, but not using my web browser, but really something more operative, but something that operating guys want to do. Operating guys want to do one thing is issue command in the shell. So what I will do now is to connect myself to the application. So here I'm using Telnet. Don't use that in production. <laughs> or avoid, at least. So we also support SSH with a key and so on. So here we have a simple uh, help. I should, yeah, yeah. Help you. Uh, a simple shell uh, where you can know absolutely everything about your, verti uh, about your vertex application, like uh, vertical ls. So the list of verticals that are deployed, I can send event on the event bus, I can receive event on the event bus, I can spawn new jobs, I can get metrics, and so on and so on. So you can almost do everything. But here, I want to know the whiskey I have. So I would like to add a new commands to this shell. Uh, what should I do? Are the only things that Vertex can do, deploy a new vertical. So, this vertical will be developed in Groovy because, well, for commands, Groovy makes a lot of sense. And I don't really want to write a new commands in Java. I need to compile it and so on. Poof, then Groovy, I just send it. So here is my Groovy vertical. Groovy vertical can be uh, organized as either as a Groovy class extending a vertical or Groovy vertical or just as a script. And the script, actually, so this will be called in the start method of your vertical. So it's a simple vertical. You get access to the vertex instance and use, uh, uh, connect to the GDBC and display it. So let's deploy it. Copy the pass. Vertical deploy. Ah, do I have my methods, my new commands? So it's product list. There we go. I've deployed a new command. So I'm connected to something working remotely. I don't know where. So I've just connected using Telnet, implemented a new vertical, deployed a command, execute the command. And this is really something very important if you want to have metrics or to know all your, you know, all your services are running and so on. So I can obviously leave. But the thing is, is I really would like to stop my application now. So I can do a PS and find it and so on, but that's, uh, that's not really what I want to do. So what I, what I can do is say, hey, give me the list of the applications that are running in the background. And um, yeah, that's the idea of, the, the, com of the, of the application. You get it when you do the start one. Huh? It's the same ID. And you do stop with this ID. And no, I think I'm running out of whiskey. Yeah, I'm sad. So. Well, uh, we're not generating nice name as Docker, but uh, just UID. OK, let's speak about services a bit. Um, in this application, right now, it's everything is together. But maybe I want to extract the persistent part and interact it using a, a service, an event based service. So it's what we do here. So I did this <coughs> interface, which is an asynchronous interface. You can look at it. It's uh, um, you always pass handler to know when it's done. So get hold. So get hold. It's a handler that get an async result with a list of whiskeys and so on and so on. <coughs> and so, on. so it's very simple. And this interface has two annotations. One is to generate the proxy and the handler and the vertex gen one generate all the clients for all the non-Java language. So <coughs> Ruby, Ruby, uh, Eric, because Eric Java is more or less considered as a language for us, uh, and so on, and, uh, Ruby and JavaScript and Node.js. So if I build this, at the compilation <coughs> time, so what happened here, we have annotation processors that are going to uh, implement and to generate all the uh, source code we need. So it has generated so very weird uh, classes to implement it. So it's made by Roger the robot. <laughs> Don't ask. I didn't do this part. Roger the robot has also implemented the handler so to consume it, but it also did <coughs> the JavaScript part. So the 
This is the client code if you want to consume my service from JavaScript. And this is the client code if you want to consume it from your browser or from Node. So you don't need to have a Vertex application to consume a Vertex service. You can use uh, your browser or Node or whatever. Um, yeah, well, if I run Obviously, at one point in time, you need to implement your service. As it's an interface, it implements your service. You just implement it. No surprise. And you de just deploy it as a vertical. So there's really nothing uh, magic behind the scene here. Um, the thing is, I was mentioning also Ruby. It would be nice to have the Ruby client, too. And what we do to get the Ruby client is just adding a Maven dependency, or whatever build system you use dependency. So it will be vertex long Oop. B. I think we changed the name, no? Yes. That works. Yep. <coughs> if I repackage it at the compilation time, it will also generate the Ruby client. So you can already decide whatever client you want according to the language you, you want to support and so on. So if I go back here, yeah, new folder and a Ruby file. So as I'm not really a Ruby developer, I cannot really comment this, but it's Ruby code. At least it has a .rb extension, so it's probably Ruby. So, um, well, I can run this application. Oh, aha, uh -huh. network, love it. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> Where it is? Uh, up, uh, no, up there. No, no, that was not the wrong up. Uh, H A. Yeah, I didn't I did that one. So here it's just as uh, right now I'm using Hazelcast, and Hazelcast is speaking uh, is uh, taking a network interface, more or less randomly chosen. Well, so generally the first one, but sometimes it's not the right one. It will just happen right now, so I just need to tell him that you need to use this one. Now if I restart, so it will be the same uh, whiskey app. Still oh. holding. No, no handler for handler because I forget to launch it, right? Yes. So what happened here is that I'm calling a service, but the service is not there. So <coughs> start to. Please don't die on stage. No, no I'll try not. Yeah, that will won't be accepting next year. Yeah. So no, 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 that's uh, You don't have to start it with, yeah. Yes, <coughs> there it is. So I have two applications, one exposing a service is consumed by the other one. They are both on the same vertical. Uh, to use it, as I've generated the Java client, Java client is always generated. Um, it will just be persistent service, create a proxy, the service is provided at this address, this event bus address, and I use it as any Java object. So that will be the last demo we will do. Obviously, this is not the end. If you Vertex start to have a kind of attraction right now, we have more and more users, more and more features. Um, if you want to start, there is this uh, Vertex.io, which is the main website. We have an exhaustive documentation for all the language we support. Uh, there is a blog post series, because sometimes when you start doing uh, asynchronous development, you say, well, by what should I start, and so on. So it starts really step by step, explain you, OK, here is how you will do it in Maven. Here is how you test your application, because it's asynchronous testing, too. Here is how you run it, your integration test. Here is how you connect to GDBC, to MongoDB, and so on. So we're still continuing this, uh, this uh, blog post series. That's the first post. 
And in the last GitHub repository, we have more than 100 different examples using the different features, many features that we didn't present here. Um, well, if you have any question, we will be either right now or we'll be around the Red Hat bus and so during the breaks and so on. Thank you very much for your attention.